Hey there, it's Dr. J. Happy Monday. Let's dig in. Today's a live Q&A session, functional medicine on demand. All right, Jack JMC writes in, I'm on GI Clear 1, 4, and Para 1 for a parasitic and bacterial infection. Um, is fruit, manuka honey, and goat cheese okay to consume while on the cleanse? Uh, manuka honey should be fine. A little bit of fruit and carbohydrate and safe starch should be fine as well. Now, regarding the goat cheese, it just it just depends on how sensitive you are. I mean, I typically like to keep the dairy out 100%, but if you've been able to do a reintroduction on that and you can handle ghee and butter okay and your symptoms are stable and under control and you're not having any negative reactions with it and you're following that um, diet reintroduction handout, that's a really good sign. Kitty Johnson writes in, I cannot live without HCL. Can I restore my own production of HCL clearing out the gut after I clear out the gut infection or once I've lost the ability to produce HCL, I have... I have to be on supplement forever. Um, you should be able to get the HCL production back up. One of the big things is just getting stress under control. So deep breathing, nasal breathing is really helpful. Um, really making sure you're eating in a good, you know, relaxing environment. Making sure you go to the six R's, right? Remove the bad foods, replace enzymes and acids. Um, help support the adrenals, the stress handling glands, the hormones, the gut lining. Make sure you're infection free. Make sure probiotics and commensal bacteria are supported. And then make sure everything's dialed in. But I mean, it's possible for sure. But in the meantime, think of supporting HCL and enzyme levels as like, you know, the low hanging fruit in functional medicine. Because of course, we want to be getting most of our nutrition through our food. And if we can't digest the food properly because of poor enzyme and acid levels, that's going to make it harder for us to heal. All right, let me keep on diving in here, guys. Uh, Josh writes in, can anyone else not view the Q&A? Oh, I think we're okay here. Barbara Scott writes in, I'm still waiting. Don't think he's here. I'm here. Hey, Spivey, hope you're doing well. Matt White writes in, hey, Matt, what's your thoughts on cooking with aluminum foil, such as food? Just place it on it with a pan. That's a questionable one. I've thought about that over the years. I typically use a Pyrex. So I just go to Amazon and just invest in some really good Pyrex. The Pyrex is based on glass. And I think that's going to be a safer way to do it. I mean, if 10 to 20% of the time you're doing it, I don't think it's a big deal. But if it's part of your staple way of cooking, I would invest in a good Pyrex as a better way. I actually just got some really good uh, new Cafalon nonstick pans that are chemical free. It's a, it's a porcelain nonstick. I think it's called the green pan. Um, you can Google it online, but it's, a, it's one of the first non-chemical it's a porcelain based nonstick and I'm absolutely loving it. So easy to saute up my eggs and, and cook stuff on there. Really easy to clean. A lot of the typical conventional nonstick, they're fluoride based. And that's a concern because if it's nonstick, there's a potential that some of that fluoride's getting off. I know there's some anecdotal research that the gas that comes off the um, nonstick and has been able to kill birds in the past. Not a good situation there, but in general, um, the chemical free ones are much better. Um, Matt writes, do you have any thoughts on running half marathons and how to best recover hormonally and adrenal wise? Yeah. I mean, the best thing you can do for that is uh, lots of mitochondrial support, CoQ10, carnitine, ribose, branched chain amino acids. I would even utilize PQQ and a lot of free form amino acids as well. Now, knowing you, Matt, you're kind of more of an ectomorph, so you'd be able to handle it more. Just, you know, make sure afterwards you're, you know, you're able to recover. You're not feeling training's not depleting you, right? Make sure you're on top of your health goals. Marathons, very, very half marathons, very strenuous on the adrenal. So make sure you're already in good shape doing it. And using a lot of those key nutrients will be very helpful for recovery. And also just getting really good soft tissue support. So your muscle is very pliable and supple and not like beef jerky and hard and stiff. Robert writes in, what's the best test for H. pylori? Well, I like the GI map test. I think that's a great test. If you want to have your conventional doc run an H. pylori breath test, you know, if that's covered by your insurance, go for it. But that's not like the gold standard for me. But if it comes back, that's helpful. You, we can always run like an IgG, IgA, IgM blood test for it. But I've been liking the, the GI map H. pylori test. And if someone wants to order it, you can always um, jump on justinhealth.com slash shop. And you click on the lab test section and look for that GI map test. Macrofit writes in, I take keto tiffin. Ooh, hold on, where'd it go? Um, let's see here. I take keto tiffin, a mast cell stabilizer, which raises the body's own antihistamine, a blocker of the H1 receptor. Can this reduce HCL like an H2 blocker by the reduction of histamine? Wow, that's a great question, Matt. I'm going to have to think about that. Uh, I think it's possible. You know, if we look at some of these antihistamine medications, I think some of the side effects is digestive upset, digestive issues. 
Um, so it's, it's very, very possible that that is um, the case. So we could go to rxlist.com and look at the mechanism of action and see if uh, what the known side effects are. Hey, Matt, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Any more questions, let me know. Um, Robert writes in, if the GI map doesn't show it, doesn't it mean you don't have it right? Yeah, it's possible for sure. Um, it just depends on the patient's clinical symptoms. If they have symptoms and the H. pylori doesn't come back, but they have other fungal overgrowth or bacterial overgrowth um, issues that show up, it's very possible that those issues could be driving the other symptoms, right? So we really have to make sure we get a full clinical representation of what's happening. Doreen writes in, I have chronic tinnitus. Do you have any suggestions to cure it? Well, Doreen, when it comes to tinnitus issues, a lot of it, about 25% of it's autoimmune. And there's a strong correlation between Hashimoto's and tinnitus. So of course, the low-hanging fruit is going autoimmune, right? Autoimmune template. So gluten-free, grain-free is a, is a good starting point. And then you really want to dig in deeper to the gut, dig in deeper to the adrenals, dig in deeper to the kind of functional medicine things, but at least start off, you know, with those foundational things um, to start. Um, could you riff on ozone? So ozone is a three molecules of oxygen tied together. So there's three bonds in between each one. So oxygen, three bonds, oxygen, three bonds, oxygen. So it's supposedly it's, you know, really good antimicrobial. They use it in swimming pools now and some to help kill microbes and such. And um, just really a good safer option for killing things. Now, in my clearing lines, I have not found a company out there that produces supplemental ozone. It's not something in the functional medicine world that is being used, I think, orally. There are a lot of doctors doing it IV wise, you know, for my business being virtual, that doesn't lend itself for optimal usage. So I think it can be beneficial. I think if you can find a doc that is skilled in it, and you make it a part of a clearing program, I think it could be helpful. Nothing bad to say about it, though. Matt writes in, what are your thoughts on enemas, usually with a reverse osmosis or bottom water? Um, would it be causing too much washout of good bacteria if kept shallow in the rectum? Um, I'll do this before runs. Well, here's the deal. I mean, I think if you have good motility, I don't think doing enemas are worth it. If you're going to do an enema, I think the more worthwhile enema because of its detoxification effects would be a coffee enema. Because the coffee enema, that coffee, the caffeine hits your gallbladder and liver, and that increases glutathione recycling by like 800%. And it also causes the liver and the gallbladder to dump a whole bunch of toxins in the intestines, which are now filled with coffee. So then when you get up, you basically can all that all those toxins can run out. So I think if you're going to be doing an enema, it's a uh, coffee enema is going to be the, the better way to do it. Um, Dr. Rakowski, a mentor of mine, his famous slogan is the best part of waking up is Folgers in your butt. So once you hear that, you'll never forget it. Let's keep on rolling, guys. Oliver writes in, what are your best animal? What are the best animal bones to use for type of collagen or a pair of disc injury? Is there any different type that it doesn't matter? I prefer chicken for taste. Oh, great question. Um, regarding, I use grass fed beef one. So I source my bones um, from Argentina and we try to use pasture fed or organic. They're not certified because of the farms don't, you know, they aren't gonna invest the money to do it, but they are coming from sources that meet that standard. And I like a lot of the beef ones, but I think it's great to do chicken noodle soup and you just get the whole chicken, like the whole rotisserie chicken and just throw it in a crock pot or an Instapot and then just let it cook Instapot like 45 minutes or a crock pot, you know, eight to 10 hours. And you can get a lot of those good nutrients there or just find a really good collagen product. Mine's true collagen, which is good. So I'm a little bit more partial to the beef, but Heck, man, there's a reason why chicken noodle soup or, you know, we can sub out the noodles and just do chicken soup in a crock pot has been has really good healing properties for it as well. Let me head over to Facebook real quick. Bob writes in on keto, my total cholesterol and HDL increased to high 200s and 100 respectively, but TG is at 41. HDL is at 90. Should I be concerned? Doctor pushing statins, other alternatives, high 200s. No, nah, I wouldn't worry about it. Your HDL ratio is like 3.2, 3.3 to 1. Not even worried about it, Bob. Um, Vladimir writes in, what about excess iron? Last time they drew blood from me, I felt amazing. I eat lots of red meat. My hemoglobin's high normal range. Maybe iron overload. It's a problem for me. How to test for it? Well, Vladimir, you already have done the treatment. The treatment is to give blood. And typically... You know, if you're a functional medicine kind of biohacker, you should be doing at least one to two tests a year. So two tests a year will 
will suffice significantly. And then maybe one or two other times you just give blood and you are set and ready to go, my man. But I mean, you can test that with serum iron and ferritin. Larry Watson writes that I only eat meat, cheese, and vegetables IF for the last two weeks, and I have dry mouth when waking. Well, first thing I would do is get a whole bunch of good Celtic sea salt and put it in water. Um, or so you can do real salt. Redmond's real salt is my favorite. You can also play around with some new salt, which is a potassium chloride based salt. See how you do with that. Get some extra minerals in and see how that helps. It could be some mineral issues. Lisa writes in, best D-ribose on the market. Ah, plain D-ribose? I'm not sure about that. But I mean, I would just go get it from a top tier company. Um, I can't think of one that just sells D-ribose by itself. I think Orthomolecular used to. That's a good company. In my Mito Synergy product, I do have some D-ribose in it. We combine it with the CoQ10 and some of the other mitochondrial Bs and L-carnitine and, and creatine, et cetera. Uh, Noah writes in, hey, Noah. Do you ever test adiponectin, IL-6, or TNF-alpha? Any comments on usefulness? Personally, I don't test it. There are some lab companies out there. I think Cyrex does a panel that looks at that. I know LabCorp and, and Quest, you can order it. The problem with it becomes is what's now driving the inflammation? What's now increasing the IL-6? What's now increasing the TNF-alpha? So it's kind of an effect-based test. It's not a cause-based test. It's not looking at the root cause of what's driving it. It's looking at the effect. So, I mean, if you want, if you have unlimited resources and you want to just test it and then look at the cause and then get the cause addressed, hey, the cause is neutralized and then come back and test this later, um, that's cool. Uh, but it just depends on where you're at. I typically would not utilize it. But if you have the right mindset, like I just said, and you understand it's not the cause, <clears throat> then it can be helpful. What is the cause of histamine issues and how can you fix it? Great question. Cause of histamine issues is gut inflammation or systemic inflammation. And what the cause of that is? Well, I could write a book on it. <laughs> I think I have. Oh, my, my thyroid book has a lot of that info in it. Um, but in general, fix the gut, go through the six R's, fix the hormones, fix the mitochondria, fix the diet, fix the digestion, all of that. So multifaceted, but in general, it's the gut inflammation. Again, if you listen to my podcast with Yasmina Yakelenstan, and she just, just found out she passed away just a few weeks ago, um, which is really sad. And again, my postulate on that is I know she was a CNN anchor and she operated a lot and did a lot of interviewing and reporting at the ground level in a lot of these war-torn areas. So maybe some depleted uranium type of exposure. She seemed like a really healthy woman so and provided a lot of great intel. So her thing was gut inflammation, get to the root of the gut inflammation. Um, Barbara Scott writes in, can we trust Costco chicken for being healthy if making bone soup? I mean, I would just look and see if it's certified organic. I would use that as a pretty good label. USDA organic label is pretty good label. Let me see here, y'all. What's next on my list? Matt White writes in again, I've never been uh, big on snacking before, but I recently utilized an Epic bar or some salmon before workout, even if it's been two hours since the last meal. Uh, what's your take on smaller meals and frequent protein? I think it depends. I think if you have a lot of blood sugar issues, it makes sense. Um, if you're trying to use it for a little workout performance uh, enhancement, that could be good. I mean, I would typically utilize a shake before that just because it's already liquid and it can get into my bloodstream faster. So for workout standards, I want those aminos and nutrients in my bloodstream and I don't want the digestion of it to slow it down. So I think it's a great way. Like I think snacks are great. Like it's noontime. I ate at noon. I'm going to have dinner at six or seven with my wife. Ooh, that's a long time. Maybe I want something around four or five to get me there, right? That could be good. Or if you just have really fried adrenals and blood sugar and you want to eat every two to three hours to support that, that can be good. But I think in the meantime, that's a good option for you, Matt. But I would try to go to a more of a liquid uh, meal only just for the reason of this so you can access those nutrients during your workout. Are clammy hands and feet possibly an adrenal problem? It's possible. Yep, it very much is, Robert. Uh, Bridget writes in, my son is weightlifting. He does not eat meat anymore, no dairy either. What should be the right amino acid, um, right amino acid supplement for him to take? Well, I would at least get him sold on some free-form amino acids and or you could always throw in some collagen amino acids or some pea protein. And I would also stack in there some BCAAs and a little bit of creatine. And that can be done post-workout is, is fine as well. And that'll give them some really good amino acids. And at least you can, you know, highlight the fact, hey, it's not animal-based. Um, the collagen would be, but like the P or the free-form aminos or the BCAAs wouldn't. So that's a good starting point if you're trying to 
sell them on that. Uh, Jack JMC writes in, starting to cleanse. I've been seeing lots of weird stuff on the stool. I've been seeing this white tablet-like pill in there. Um, it could be a parasitic egg. Well, if you mention the para one, it's very possible you could have some stuff coming out. So keep an eye on that. But I mean, it's I, I hear it all the time. It's really <laughs> quite unnerving having that experience. Josh writes in, any thoughts on ox bile supplementation, feeding hydrogen sulfide bacterial overgrowth? That's interesting. I mean, here's the deal. Ox bile is an acid, right? Like bile acid. So these acids actually should help um, keep bacteria in check. Uh, Dr. Ben Lynch has talked about this. You know, one of the things when you have low bile salt levels, one, you don't digest healthy fats, but number two, the acids as the bile acid derivative helps keep bacteria in check. So I think bile would be more antibacterial. I don't know about it driving any hydrogen sulfide bacterial overgrowth. And also we need it to help break down our fat soluble vitamins. So I think the hydrogen sulfide bacterial overgrowth is something I wouldn't worry about if that's the case. Uh, Lara writes in how much B one a day. That's a great question. Typically, um, I'm going to be just taking my multi and my mito synergy support. That's where I get my big B vitamins. Um, but the actual dose, I'm not sure exactly. I think it's about 1000% the RDA. I'm pretty sure that's where it's at. I have to go look at some of my labels and add it up. Uh, Colin writes in, choline has been great for my liver and lipid digestion, but after a week, of continuous use, it's causing brain fog. Any reason for that? Well, I would just say, how do you know it's the choline? Any other changes? Are you doing any gut killing? Is there anything else happening? How do you know it's that? Could be a food issue. Um, do you believe that chemtrails are poisoning us? Well, that's interesting. I mean, there is some data that's come out that, you know, some of the planes that you see over the sky, not contrails, but chemtrails, there's some barium salt and aluminum salts that are being dropped from the sky, whether they're doing it for weather modification or whether their intentions are good or bad, I don't know, I can't read into the intentions, but there is some evidence that some of those aluminum and barium salts are coming, are being dropped down. Now the question is how much of that's having a negative effect? I'm not sure. And I would need to get more data on that before I, you know, I wouldn't jump to any conclusions of it, but I think it, it is happening and how much the effects are negative, hard to say, but the aluminum part of it definitely is concerning for sure. And that's why I filter out my water. I have a whole house filtration system and a reverse osmosis just to make sure that, you know, I'm getting any water exposure knocked down. Um, Claudia writes in any advice on genital herpes? Well, I mean, get your immune system stronger. I know people that have genital herpes, herpes and they don't have any outbreaks for years on end. And remember, you're not contagious unless there's an outbreak. So big thing is get your immune system stronger. I mean, there's things you can do like medicinal mushrooms and silver, and reishi and cat's claw and a lot of good uh, monolurn and all these different compounds that can be helpful. Get your gut fixed, get your overall nutrient levels dialed in. Let's see here, Genesis wrote in here. Give me one second, y'all. Uh, where did that go? All right. How should a female learn to transition into intermittent fasting safely and healthily? Well, first thing is I would make sure that you have no fatigue and no hormonal issues and you have a really stable cycle. That's number one. That's first step. Number two, I would first start off with a, uh, a 16 by eight, just cause it's a really easy way to transition. So you would eat at noontime, four o'clock and eight o'clock. That way you at least can get three meals a day. So if you're used to getting all your nutrients in three meals, it's really simple. 12, four and eight versus like a nine, 12 and five, and maybe a snack later on. That way it's pretty easy. You just compress your meals to a 12 to eight window. Number two, you just make sure that you're getting enough nutrition in that window that you would normally get in a day because we don't want to have low nutrition in there. And that'd be my first step. The key is though, make sure hormones and energy and moods all stable because if we start to have a backslide in energy or mood, we can point our fingers to what the issue is. But if we don't start from a place of stable foundation, we're not going to know what is causing what. All right, Josh writes in, how can we reconcile the supposed benefits of intermittent fasting on the digestive cleansing waves um, need to balance adrenals? I'm not sure what you're, what you're referring to there. Um, but in general, um, intermittent fasting, I think, can be beneficial. I just think it, don't make it an everyday thing. Kind of use it punctuated throughout the week and, and make sure you're healthy before you really work on making that a part of your protocol. Uh, Claudia writes in, by the way, thank you, doctor. We're your biggest fans. Greetings from the Netherlands. Awesome. Well, thank you, Claudia. I appreciate it. 
Noah writes in, do you occasionally eat A2 milk products such as sheep and goat milk or A2 superior to A1? Yeah, so that has to do with like some of the various protein compounds and some of the, the milks. I think it's Clarivale is one of the farms in Jersey, New Jersey, and they use grass-fed, organic, raw, A, I think it's A1 is the better one. I, I forget, I can't recall. Typically, I stay away from dairy products. The only dairy I'll have is some ghee and I'll have some grass-fed butter which is typically going to be fat-based, very tiny amounts of protein. The A1, A2 primarily is an issue with the protein. So you're going to see that more in your milks and in your cheeses, so to speak. So Clairavale is a good one that I think has the beneficial um, A version in there. Uh, Robert writes in, what are good fat options if I can't have butter and nuts because of an autoimmune diet and no avocado because of histamine issues. Well, number one, when you're on an autoimmune template, you can do avocado oil because the carbohydrate um, portion of the histamine is not there. Number two, palm's a good choice. Coconut's a good choice. Epic has some beef tallow and duck tallow. That's a really good choice as well. And again, you're patient. So look at the guide to eating fat in my members area to give you some other options. And then my goal is that you're only on an autoimmune diet for three to four weeks. And then we follow that diet reintroduction handout. We add foods back in one food every two to three days, smaller amount on day one, larger amount on day two and three. And if we can tolerate it, you know, we can add some of those foods back in. Bridget writes in, my mom has very swollen feet. She's on blood pressure meds and statins. Do you think serapeptidase could help? Well, I mean, serapeptidase would definitely help. It's a good natural anti-inflammatory. It helps bust up scar tissue and inflammatory compounds. But I would really want to get to the root cause of why she's on these statins and BP meds. And I want to work with her doctor to get these things under control. So first thing, get her diet and get her inflammation right. Easy things to do to help with blood pressure is going to be magnesium. There's lots of good herbs like hawthorn that can help get the blood pressure and the magnesium under control. Make sure the diet and the refined sugar and all the junky fats are dialed in first. And if you wanted to add some enzymes, you could, but I think you have the cart before the horse there. Get the root cause address, get the diet address first, and then use that as a another palliative option. Uh, Josh writes in, um, I will second the question for, for Robert. I've been asking this myself. Yep, so hopefully I answered that question above regarding the food reintroduction and the nuts and seeds. All right, cool. Rakesh writes in, over one month of gut clearing, little improvements. Uh, but still brain fog, low energy, using GI clear one, two, five. Well, keep it up. I mean, I would just say right now, how are you doing with the diet? Did you do the autoimmune or low FODMAP template to begin with? Did you do the reintroduction? Were there any um, reactions that you had as you reintroduced foods? What did you notice there? And when we chat next, we can dive in a little bit deeper and figure out, you know, plan B, plan C, plan D. I think it's really important for patients if they don't have the results they're looking for, there's always a way we can dive in deeper and having that good two-way communication helps because, you know, there's always a plan B, a plan C, a plan D. And a lot of times we don't have to execute that plan. So we always hold the, the, the lower probability stuff for later on if we need. Uh, Noah writes in, do you believe in the concept of TH1 versus TH2? Well, it's not a concept. It's actual immunology science. So you have TH1, which is the cytotoxic immune system, that, which is like your natural killer cells. It's the first line of defense for your immune system. Think of it as like the Navy SEALs, the Delta team, the Army Rangers, right? It's that first line of defense for the for our, our military. And then say, TH2 is going to be our humoral-based immune system. That's our antibody, IgG, IgA, IgM. And this is going to be like the infantry that comes after the fact. And this is kind of the branch of the immune system that the, the vaccine supposedly increased, right? So you have the Th1, Th2, and certain things boost Th1 like medicinal mushrooms and echinacea and endrographis and those type of um, glandular compounds. And then we have Th2, which is going to be bumped up more by bioflavonoids, caffeine, resveratrol, grape, grape seed extract, pine pollen, green tea, coffee extracts. So yeah, this is totally real, real science and real immunology stuff. Now, the question about it is, I don't typically go after and treat one branch of an immune system. I get the infections and get the stressors under control. And there's, you know, we can give certain things to help, but get the root cause of why it's out of balance to begin with. Uh, Matt's back again. Would you recommend for a shake based on protein, say before a workout? So I think collagen's great. Um, I think collagen's excellent. If you're doing a lot of marathon training, you may want to look at adding in some ketone esters. I think you also throw in maybe some pea protein along with the collagen. 
throw in some BCAAs. I think that's, and then maybe some uh, crealkaline creatine. That'd be a great stack for your workout. And Michelle writes in, high LDL in women often goes with hypothyroidism. Which doctors treat with statins rather than work on the thyroid? Yeah, it's really sad. Conventional medical doctors in the early 80s used to treat high cholesterol levels with thyroid hormone, which don't get me wrong, in a lot of people, just treating it and giving someone a hormone may not be the root cause, right? But it's still a hell of a lot safer than giving statins today, right? Statins have a lot of ne negative side effects. And we know people with low cholesterol below 120 have increased rates of cancer and psychotic illness. So it's like, okay, well, you have high cholesterol, now it's too low. And then now you have now you're going to die from the, the third killer, right? And it's like heart disease and cancer go back and forth. So it's like, man, you're, you're trading one devil for another devil. You can get to the root cause. Michelle writes in, nuts are high on copper. Check your zinc. Yeah, I mean, other nuts you can do is going to be um, pumpkin seeds are really good, really high in zinc as well. That could be a good one. Um, private confessions, how to convince doc to prescribe you pancreatic enzymes. Well, I mean, if they're a good functional medicine, natural doctor, they should understand that's a foundational issue. If you have digestion issues, if not, um, find someone, find a good enzyme that you can purchase from the internet. I mean, one I have is called, um, enzyme synergy. If you go to justinhealth.com slash shop. You can get that one there. That's a good one. Um, Dr. Dreamer, Dr. J, um, are the after effects of SSRIs permanent? Meaning, does your body return to normal after stopping? And can you use dopamine support while on an SSRI, i.e. tyrosine and macuna? Well, it's a, that's a really good question. So in general, if we get to the underlying cause of why the SSRI was needed, technically, yes. So if digestion's better, if the underlying stress is better, all the lifestyle things, food, digestion's better, and we use additional amino acids to help replete the neurotransmitters and the synapse, that can be helpful. Uh, can you use dopamine? Yeah, I would because SSRIs used long-term will create dopamine deficiencies because it's going to hang out. It's going to cause more serotonin to hang out between the synapses and the aromatic decarboxylase enzyme that metabolizes serotonin also metabolizes dopamine. So there's some, some theories out there that increased serotonin reuptake inhibitors can cause dopamine deficiencies. And then a lot of the Parkinson's drugs like the Cinemet or the Carbidopa Levodopa, those can also create serotonin deficiencies. So I think it's good that you take a lot of the amino acids and the like the l dope like the L-DOPA or the tyrosine, some of that along with it's good, as well as some of the cofactors, B6, your B vitamins. Vitamin C is really important, essential fatty acids. You really want to work with, a, and it sounds like you may be a doc yourself. You really want to work with someone that's a, a trained clinician in this that can help you. Um, Rakesh writes in, vitamin C use has helped with my sinus issues, but palm sweats a lot as colostrum can be used while doing a gut cleanse. Well, colostrum can be very helpful as part of a healing protocol during a gut cleanse. So in, in my kind of sphere here, my worldview, we have the six R's of doing uh, and dressing someone's gut. The first R is removing bad foods, right? Second R is replacing enzymes and acids and digestive salts so we can better break down our foods. The third R is going to be repairing the gut lining. And repairing the gut lining can mean amino acids. It can mean aloe. It can mean DGL licorice. It can mean some of the things like colostrum. And we also work on repairing the hormones. Why? Because the hormones tend to have really good anti-inflammatory effects, especially cortisol. So if we have a lot of gut inflammation, getting the inflammation in the gut down uh, will help. So we address the root cause, but we also use and support our hormones that naturally do it as well. Uh, what causes coldness and yellow stools besides thyroid? A low low um, gallbladder function, poor bile salt production will definitely have an effect and cause your stools to be more yellow or gray because you're not digesting um, fat. And then what medical test can you use to diagnose it? Well, I mean, the best thing is going to be clinical indication. Um, if you see yellowy stools or, or floating stools, that can be helpful. Uh, you may see an increase in bilirubin or GGT on your CMP panel. And how long after H. pylori can you take HCL? I mean, you can take it, you know, as needed ongoing. It's not going to be something that's going to negatively affect your body. I don't see it being a problem. Ideally, we want more of our body's natural production to kick in so, you know, you can gently taper that off as you're infection free and you're getting more and more healthy. All right, y'all. Hope that was really helpful today. It was great checking in with all you here. I wish you all the best and I'll be back here hopefully this Friday morning. I'll check in with y'all.
You guys have a phenomenal week. Give me a like, give me a share, subscribe. Make sure you get the updates so you know when I go live. So really appreciate uh, the back and forth, guys. Take care. Bye.